The following film contains themes and graphic imagery that may disturb or offend some viewers. My name is Geoffrey Down and I'm the curator at the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. I look after all their his historical collections in association with archives and collections. The College of Surgeons was founded in 1927 uh, and it's an educational institution. It was founded to establish and maintain a certain level of standards in surgery. Uh, the most significant collection, I think, is the Sidcup collection. Um, that collection is now the most complete collection, I think, in the world of maxillofacial surgery of the First World War. Maxillofacial surgery relates to injuries of the mouth, teeth, jaws and face. The Sidcup collection comprises patient files, photographs, x-rays, facial casts and sketches, which all relate to the facial reconstructive surgery pioneered during the First World War. Some of the material is quite graphic and confronting. The First World War is, um, is different from just about all other wars that went before because it was war on an industrial scale. And it was uh, you know, death, carnage and destruction on, a, on an industrial scale. There were two major types of injury during the First World War, both of which were mechanical. One was from bullet wounds, the other was from shrapnel. If you stuck your head up above the trench, you were likely to get a bullet in the head. Doctors had never seen such horrific injuries of this scale and nature before, and lots of soldiers died from wounds that could have been treated. As the war progressed, so did medical science and practice. As a result, soldiers suffering horrific facial wounds began to come off the battlefield alive. But these men were in a terrible condition and required specialised treatment. The problem was that they found that these men would have large tracts of bone taken away, they'd lose their jaws, they'd lose their noses, and there was no way that they could be properly fixed. They couldn't eat properly, they couldn't breathe properly, they couldn't speak, they couldn't do anything basic. And so this, this was an emerging problem in the First World War. So by 1917 they decided to, uh, to do something about it and set up this hospital. It was the passion and determination of New Zealand surgeon Harold Gillies that led to the establishment of a specialised hospital for soldiers suffering facial injuries. The Queen Mary Hospital in Sidcup, Kent, just outside of London, operated from 1917 until 1925 for this purpose. Sidcup Hospital was a, a, a arranged by country, according to, virtually according to the divisions of the British Empire, basically. Um, Australians and New Zealanders, uh, the British, uh, Canadians, and the person in charge of the Australian section was Henry Simpson Newland, um, and he was really the first person in Australia to perform plastic surgery seriously. He'd got in, involved in it and interested in it before the First World War in Adelaide. There were virtually no rules and they had to make it up as they went along. They had to rebuild faces virtually from scratch. Now there are some faces which could not be rebuilt. We, we have here in our collection some very horrific and confronting images of men whose face is completely blown away and there's only a fragment left. There's nothing you can do about that. You had to put on a mask a bit like the Phantom of the Opera basically to hide the disfigurement. The surgeons working at Sidcup used trial and error to undertake the reconstructive surgery. They knew a little about ancient rhinoplasty techniques and how to reset teeth, and used bone plates to patch fragmented jaw bones back together again. They used basic materials like leather, cast iron and brass, and developed various diagnostic tools so they could better understand their patients' injuries. They had Darrell Lindsay, for example, um, in the Australian section doing uh, full colour drawings uh, of the, the, the wounds. Darrell Lindsay was recruited as a war artist and uh, yeah, later in life he became director of the National Gallery of Victoria. So he's, and of course there were copious photographs, photographs from, from every single angle of, uh, and of various things too, of before, during, after. Um, it's always a bit, bit of something that, that intrigues people. Why, when you've got photographs, why would you do such a thing? And I think the reason is that the watercolour sketch gives you something about the patient's whole being, about the internal 
quite as an artist can can see. And also, most importantly, the casts, because in the days before computer imaging, the cast was really the only way that you could get a three-dimensional image of what you were dealing with. They really had to get some idea of how they were going to reconstruct this person, A, to make, make them functional again, um, being able to breathe, being able to eat and drink, and being able to speak, and uh, then make them look good. Now, making them look good was only secondary. One of the men treated at Sidcup Hospital was Australian soldier Charles Ernest Pritchard. He was barely 23 when he enlisted and left Australia for the battlefield in April of 1916, not knowing that he would come back a changed man. He was wounded twice. He had a, um, a chest and finger wound uh, first off and then he got this very serious facial wound. It was a gunshot wound to the jaw which did a considerable amount of damage to him. Um, but it's not nearly as, as horrific as some of, of, of the, the images that we've got, both in, um, in Darrell Lindsay's sketches and in the photographs. Sidcup Hospital was surrounded by quaint English countryside, but for the patients, life was far from idyllic. They spent months or years undergoing multiple surgical procedures and recovering from the horrors of their wartime experience. One of the ladies, uh, she was an American nurse, she said there are bits and pieces there but there are no men. It was a, it was a rather sad thing to say, but uh, these, these, some of these men were understandably quite devastated, not just physically but emotionally by what had happened to them. Uh, and it was just lots and lots of TLC basically which would get these men back into some sort of um, shape inwardly so that they could get out and face the world. And I think there was a lot of camaraderie between them. Of course, um, in any situation like that where you've got men who've suffered similar injuries that they will sit around and talk about them. And I think that's how maybe they got them started, to just talk to each other about their, their injuries. A lot of them suffered when they came back because before iPhones were invented, you could go away to the war, no one would see you for four or five years. And when you came back home uh, with these sorts of disfigurements, um, the reaction from your family and your community would be highly unpredictable. Some uh, families and communities said, yes, you've gone away, you've suffered these terrible injuries in, in fighting for king and country, so you've done your duty, that's fine. Others were, were, were totally rejected. Um, and it's a very sad story so it came out of that. Nevertheless, they, they, some, these surgeons at Sidcup had done their level best to try and get these people back into some sort of working condition. The whole of modern plastic reconstructive surgery comes from this period and um, the collection here, as I've said, is significant because it now constitutes the most comprehensive complete archive of what they did.